Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fiona Bloomer from Ulster University, and I'm going to take you through the first part of the presentation. And specifically, we're going to look at how global trends in abortion policy can be explained using the framework of morality policy and what that can tell us about the trends in Northern Ireland and how they're applied in Northern Ireland. And our research demonstrates we believe that morality policy making, which does not take account of systematic scientific um, evidence, can be problematic for effective policy making. When I use the phrase morality policy, what does that mean? The scholars have um, defined it as those policies which focus on matters such as same-sex marriage, euthanasia, reproductive technologies and abortion, and which typically pit um, religious positions against those which are secular. The literature on morality policy offers some insight into the multifaceted nature of abortion policy, including consideration of government structure, politics and party system configuration, health providers, lobby groups, and cultural norms and values. In reviewing, in reviewing previous research globally, we have identified that whilst commonality exists on matters such as party political systems, that there is variation in cultural and institutional factors within different jurisdictions. So an example of that would be to look at how abortion and same-sex marriage are dealt with within countries, uh, states such as Canada and the USA and the differing impact that faith-based lobby groups have had in both of those jurisdictions as a result of their um, action. Scholars have identified how, in a dealing with contentious morality policies, that politicians will be mindful of re-election and also the predominant value base of their constituency. And bearing those in mind often results in policy non-decision. Um, a reluctance to make a definitive policy and stalling actions, such as the setting up of commissions or working groups on the particular matter. The Citizens' Assembly in the Republic of Ireland um, and the Fetal Fetal Abnormality Working Group here in Northern Ireland have both been criticised by campaigners for that very reason, as typical examples of non-decision making and delaying the process of making any legal or policy change. Looking broadly then at the international perspective, um, religious positioning on abortion typically stems from Christian right, which comprises largely the Catholic Church with evangelical Protestantism. Both have played a key role in international debates, forming what Marge Berger referred to as an unholy alliance with unlikely partners, such as conservative um, Islamic countries, Iran and Libya. Historically, it's worth noting that the anti-abortion policy of Christian churches has not always been so stringent. For instance, Rose has identified how the Catholic Church had actually a liberal position on early abortion in the 16th century. And if we look at the example of America, the American Protestant Evangelical Movement actually held liberal views on abortion up until the 1960s, and the Republican Party itself also had liberal positions on abortion up until the 1970s. At the level of the United Nations, um, morality policy is influenced through the lobbying of faith-based organisations, whose numbers circa around 300. And many of these organisations actually have significant resources, with the three largest alone having a total annual budget of equivalent to six billion US dollars. And obviously, that brings significant influence at the level of the UN. Faith-based organisations at the UN can be grouped into two broad categories, those that are conservative and those that are liberal. The conservative grouping on abortion takes a very firm stance of being anti-abortion, but also as to be expected are anti-LGBT issues, anti-having progressive sex relationship education. In contrast to that, we have the liberal grouping, which is an alliance of those who firmly believe in the woman's right to choose. And this includes organisations such as Catholics for Choice, who argue that it is in fact immoral to deny uh, access to abortion. At the UN, the Conservative groupings seek to restrict 
policy and restrict access uh, resource allocation to programmes that improve access to abortion. An example of this is the, absence of, is the absence of reproductive health as a theme in the 2001 Millennium Development Goals. And while this decision was reversed in 2005, Hume argues that the lack of focus on reproductive health resulted in an absence of resources for programmes and led to delays in progressing targets, including childhood poverty, HIV rates, also adolescent pregnancy, access to contraception. Hume argues that, in fact, those responsible for delaying the focus on reproductive health uh, placed an undue burden on the poor and poor women in particular. Moving on now to Northern Ireland. Our research is concerned with how this framework of morality policy can be applied to the Northern Ireland context and considers how those international trends are replicated in the region. Firstly, we consider the policy context and we look at how hostility, if there is evidence of hostility to abortion and misinformation about abortion. Specifically, we look at the guidance documents for health professionals which have produced, been produced by the Department of Health. Uh, departmental responsibility for providing guidance to health professionals on abortion lies um, with the Department of Health. After legal action was initiated by the FPA in early 2000s, draft guidelines were first issued in 2007 and then published in 2009. The guidelines were subject to legal challenge and eventually withdrawn in 2010. Further draft guidelines were then issued in 2013 on the eve of a further judicial review by the FPA. These draft guidelines were widely criticised by professional bodies with the most senior gynaecologist in Northern Ireland stating that they had created fear amongst his peers. Our research has analysed all the policy documents, but this afternoon I want to focus particularly on the 2013 version. A series of flaws are identifiable within that document. There is inappropriate phrasing throughout, ignoring common medical terminology. So for instance, the phrases baby and mother are used on a regular basis and phrases such as fetus and pregnant woman are barely found within the document. The document also states that abortions are highly exceptional and this flatly ignores the very readily available evidence of the women travelling to England to access abortions. The document also states that counsellors who provide advice on accessing abortions do so at their own risk as this is a grey area and has not been tested in the course in the courts, and this again flatly ignores European court judgment which states that counselling should be provided to women in those circumstances. The document also states that two doctors' consent is needed for abortion when this is not found anywhere in the Northern Ireland law. In March 2016, revised guidelines were issued, and these are markedly different from the 2013 version. They largely refer back to the tone of earlier versions, such as the 2009 document. However, the 2016 version fails to take into account the judicial review decision from December 2015, although notably it does, um, for the first time, mention that women are self-aborting at home, accessing the abortion pill from internet providers. To conclude, the policy section. The policy context over the last 15 years provides evidence of a reluctance by the state to take action to provide clarity on the law on abortion and how it can be interpreted in practice. The legal battle over the guideline has resulted in lengthy periods of time where health professionals had no guidance to enable them to interpret the law or had guidance that was inherently flawed. This, we argue, is symbolic of an anti-abortion position. The implications of this are the absence of guidelines and the stigma surrounding abortion generated by state institutions has resulted in the denial of legal abortions and has halted policy reform. My colleague Claire will now take you through the, pol the political discourse. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, my name is Claire Pearson. I'm from Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm going to speak to the second phase of our research, which was analysis of political debate on abortion in Northern Ireland. 
Um, we analysed five debates from the Northern Ireland Assembly between 2000 and 2016, both through quantitative and qualitative content analysis. A series of themes were identified throughout this analysis. These include Northern Ireland exceptionalism, the idea of Northern Ireland being a place apart, religiosity, use of terminology with regard to abortion, and factual inaccuracies about abortion. In this paper, we're going to concentrate on the factual inaccuracies, which are referred to in the literature as abortion mythology. Specifically, we're going to focus on three common myths that were identified throughout debate. That is, the idea that abortion is unsafe. Secondly, that restricting access to abortion reduces the demand for abortion. And thirdly, that women who seek abortions are particularly vulnerable or at risk. First of all, I'll present examples from within the political debate and then talk you through some academic and scientific research. So first of all, abortion is unsafe. This is a quote from a 2000 debate. Medical evidence has proven that abortion increases the chance of breast cancer by 50%. Um, the second quote is from a 2007 debate. Women face potential safety issues as a result of having an abortion. The number of deaths is small, but damage or infection to the uterus or fallopian tubes may occur and may lead to infertility. Menstrual difficulties can also result. Women may suffer significant emotional trauma. So if we turn to the World Health Organization's definition of unsafe abortion, it's defined as a procedure for terminating an unintended pregnancy carried out either by persons lacking the necessary skills or in an environment that does not conform to minimal medical standards or both. The WHO also states within this policy that where legislation allows abortion within a broad framework, the incidence and complications from unsafe abortion are generally lower than where abortion is legally restricted. Myths exist with regard to the after effects of abortion, both to mental and physical health. We see the term post-abortion syndrome commonly cited as a psychological after effect of abortion. There's no evidence, scientific evidence to support the claim of post-abortion post syndrome. Systematic scientific reviews have shown that post-abortion syndrome does not exist. It's not recognized by either the American Psychiatric Association nor the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Academics have stated categorically it has no basis in science. Systematic reviews of scientific literature have concluded that there are no differences in the long-term mental health of women who obtain induced abortions compared to women in appropriate control groups. Two common myths with regard to physical health consequences of abortion include that abortion increase, increases a woman's risk of contracting breast cancer or that abortion decreases future fertility or ability to carry a pregnancy to term. Again, this hypothesis has been robustly rejected by a number of international and national health bodies, including the WHO, the National Cancer Institute, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. A recent study which has systematically analysed st studies on the links between breast cancer has found there to be no sufficient evidence to support a positive association between abortion and breast cancer risk. Turning to the myth that abortion negatively impacts fertility or future pregnancies, whilst historically there may have been a limited risk associated with some methods for termination, advancements in medical knowledge have improved the safety of abortion procedures, with several large-scale studies noting no increased risk. In a US study on legally induced abortion, it has been found that the risk of death associated with childbirth is approximately 14 times higher than that with abortion procedures which adhere to international and national safety standards. The evidence on the safety of abortion is very clear. If abortion is carried out according to clinical standards, it is a safe healthcare procedure, and women who have abortions are not at adverse risk of mental or physical longer-term problems. The second myth, restricting access to abortion reduces the demand for abortion. This is a quote from a 2000 debate. The number of women recorded as having travelled to England for terminations has fallen, even as abortion has become less of a taboo. The number travelling is far fewer proportionally than the number of abortions carried out in England and Wales, which are not such different societies from Northern Ireland. There can be no doubt that we have a problem, but my favoured solution is for more funding for unwanted pregnancy counselling rather than an extension to Northern Ireland of the Abortion Act 1967. 
That would create an abortion culture, resulting in more abortions in the long term. Research evidence has clearly demonstrated that making abortion illegal does not stop women seeking access to abortion. The effects of restrictions on access are that women will experience unsafe abortion and incur financial hardship in doing so. The WHO estimates that 21.6 million women experience unsafe abortion worldwide per year. The rate of abortion is often higher in countries where abortion is illegal compared to countries where it is accessible. These countries are often those with poor sexual health and relationship education and poor access to contraception. If we take the example of South America, the abortion rate is 29 per thousand women of childbearing age. We contrast that with Western Europe, with countries which mainly have liberal laws, the abortion rate is 12 per thousand women. If we turn to Northern Ireland, on average 39 abortions are carried out in Northern Ireland under the NHS per year. In contrast, an average of approximately 1,000 women are travelling to England each year to access abortions which they have to pay for despite being UK taxpayers. Other women are accessing the abortion pill through providers such as Women on Web or Women Help Women. We don't have exact numbers for how many women are accessing from Northern Ireland, but we do have a recent study using data from Women on Web that indicates that over a five-year period they'd received inquiries from 5,650 women across the island of Ireland. Women accessing abortions are from a range of social backgrounds, ages and marital status, as demonstrated by data provided by the Department of, Engl Department of Health in England and Wales. It's quite clear that restricting abortion does not, seek, does not stop women seeking to access abortion. It simply displaces the activity elsewhere, either to self-abort at home or to travel to other jurisdictions. The third myth is that women who seek abortions are particularly at risk or vulnerable. This is a quote from a 2013 debate. We had a real opportunity to do something very positive, to protect mothers and their unborn children. For all sorts of reasons, we have wasted an opportunity to protect the most vulnerable in our society, women in crisis pregnancy and their unborn children. There's a growing propensity globally to position women seeking abortion as in some way vulnerable or at risk. Global anti-abortion discourse argues that restrictions on legal abortion are necessary to stop weakened irrational women from making bad decisions that harm them. This has been a switch in language from previously positioning women um, as bad to mad, and is evident in debates in the Assembly. The change in language reflects a change in public sentiment towards women seeking abortion. However, the positioning of women as vulnerable has no sound evidential base. Research indicates that women who have already visited an abortion provider for information rarely struggle with the choice of having an abortion. Research has shown that some women may experience regret, other women experience ambivalence towards their decision. And this has been seen in Leslie's research. Other studies indicate that those who seek abortion and are, den and are denied it due to time limit issues are more likely to experience regret and anger than those women who obtain abortions within a time limit. Much also remains known about the influence of abortion stigma on issues of regret and abortion decision making. The, eff the effect of this myth is twofold. It continues to propagate the idea that women seeking, wishing to access abortion are in a risky or highly emotional situation where they may, may not be able to make a choice and are highly open to manipulation. The result of this positioning becomes, makes it easier to argue that women's mental health will be compromised by having an abortion or that they're likely to experience regret. Secondly, a rhetoric of vulnerability positions women as those in need of protection and positions those who have the power to legislate and restrict access as protectors of women. In conclusion, um, our policy briefing has sought to consider the language used in abortion policy and political discourse in Northern Ireland. We've highlighted that abort abortion mythology and misinformation is common and has resulted in legal challenges to restrictive policy guidelines, the denial of legal abortion under the current law, and the stalling of legislative reform as mandated by the High Court. Northern Ireland is not unique in terms of morality policy and presents a classic case study whereby evidence is lacking in policy and lawmaking. The outcome of this policy is not to stop abortion, but to displace a healthcare procedure outside the NHS system and either to another jurisdiction or to women self-aborting at home. Thank you. Thank you.